That's a song by today's guest. His name is Mark Nuremberg. And the song, the whole thing, you can hear it on his YouTube channel is Where Do You Go When It All Fades Away? And funny story, he was telling me after the fact that this was actually a song he was improvising. So it's a song about itself. It's about the fear of the song fading away. I think I got this interpretation right. But as you'll hear in, in the interview, Mark is a very important figure in my musical life. Uh, he's someone who does a lot of different activities. He's inspiring to me in that way. He's a great painter and illustrator. He wrote a play for the Montreal Fringe Festival about Lear. And he was also a criminal defense lawyer who went all the way to the tribunal for Rwanda. So someone who's done a lot of fascinating work in his life. But most importantly to me, he plays the banjo and he plays old folk songs. And I had a funny pseudo spiritual experience when I was living in Montreal. I got involved with this group, which was, I guess, of left wing Jewish students, uh, specifically focused around advocacy for justice in Palestine, uh, but just a general way of connecting with Jewish identity, which is something I felt like I hadn't had much of a chance to do. So I went to a meeting with this group. And what became very quickly clear is most of them, for, for them, Jewishness really meant the religion to some degree, and I felt like I should participate in that. So I tried to go to a Yom Kippur service with some of them. And I walked in and this was at a reconstruction synagogue and you know, it's as, as inclusive a service as can be, but it was devastating for me because as someone who has never been religious in my whole life, all these rituals, they just were completely alienating to me. I, you know, religion was never, part of what I wanted to be. And I started asking, you know, am I really Jewish if I'm not interested in this stuff? Uh, and then I snuck out of the service early and luckily my favorite open mic, The Yellow Door was happening on that night. And I, I told Mark what I'd been through and he's like, oh, don't be ridiculous. You don't have to be into religious services at all to be Jewish. You can absolutely be a secular Jew. And on the one hand, that's something I knew all along, but uh, it just wasn't a perspective that was particularly represented in this club I was in. So to go into the space that I loved folk music so much and be reminded of this part of my identity, it was just kind of cool for me. And of course, secular Jews like Bob Dylan were a big part of shaping the folk scene. And I'd like to think I'm continuing that tradition, but you know, Mark represents a bridge for me to that tradition. Uh, he was playing at the Yellow Door back in the 70s. Uh, he's going to tell you lots of interesting stories about his growing up in what I suppose you could say was a golden age of folk and protest music. Without further ado, here's Mark Nuremberg. So, Mark, I know you as the host of the Yellow Door, uh, a little open mic uh, just off McGill campus. And for me, discovering that place was kind of like a portal to one of my dreams it's called a coffee house you have students singing folk songs and then you you at the center of it all with your banjo singing your Guthrie and your Seeger and Dylan so to me it felt like this time machine to my idealized 1960s <laughs> well that's what it is you know that the Yellow coffee house goes back to the 1960s it's the oldest still existing coffee house because it's the it's the only one from that era that's still around so uh yeah and it's 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 the 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 big huge difference between the the yellow door coffee house now 
and the Yellow Door Coffee House in the 1960s was, in the 1960s, it was seven days a week, and it was always full. And now it's one day a week, and it's only sometimes full. <laughs> right, yeah. So I, I was just curious whether you had a radically different relationship, because for me, that time is a, a fantasy. I mean, you were, I guess, an older child then, but uh, you, you still lived it. My my own relationship to folk music goes uh, way beyond that earlier. I because my parents were communists, and my father was a full time Communist Party worker. That was what his job. Um, and uh, my mother ran the Communist Party nursery school to which I went. Uh, and um, among the people that. Um, I became introduced to at the earliest age is Pete Seeger. And the only records we had in our house were these left wing records, and most of them were Pete Seeger records. And when Pete Seeger was blacklisted and could not perform anywhere in the States, my father, with some other people, brought him to Montreal to perform. And uh, he came to our house, and um, I started going to Seeger concerts when I was three. Um, and the first banjo I ever touched was his when he was at our house and um, he played some banjo, a little bit of banjo, and then he left it in the, propped up in a corner of the living room and all the adults went into the kitchen to have coffee or maybe something stronger, I'm not sure, but um, I was left alone in the living room with Pete Seeger's banjo. So I went over and I strummed it. My father came tearing into the room telling me not to touch it. Um, so, uh, you know, I knew from that time, from the first time I saw a Pete Seeger concert when I was a little kid that I wanted to play the banjo. And uh, in fact, I asked my mother, to, told my mother I wanted to play the banjo. and. And she said, well, who would teach you? I said, Pete Seeger would. <laughs> so they gave me piano lessons instead. Uh, so, so was it years later when you, you know, really got a chance to play a banjo? Yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't actually, I bought myself a banjo. Um, I don't remember if it was, I was still in my last year of high school or it was after that. I think I was in my last year of high school, but... Somebody lent me a banjo one day on Mount Royal. We went up, some people from school went up. Uh, there was a day off of school. We went up onto the Mount Royal, and somebody had a banjo, and it, it was a really, really nice old banjo, and I, I was, like, captivated by it, and I was trying to play it, and then I could I could make music out of it. And, and um, so she lent it to me, and, and all the way home, I like played it on the bus, and I played it walking down the street. And um, when I got home, she phoned me and said, my parents said, I shouldn't have lent you the banjo. <laughs> you have to bring it back. So, right. But meanwhile, on my way home from Mount Royal, I stopped at a music store, and I bought Pete Seeger's book, How to Play the Five-String Banjo. So... I returned the banjo, but I still had the book. <laughs> and um, a while later, I went to um, Mendelssohn's Pawn Shop, which I don't think exists anymore. It may still exist. And I bought the cheapest uh, banjo you could buy, which was $40. And um, it was a really super crummy, virtually unplayable instrument. And um, so I didn't actually learn how to play right away because I thought, oh, this is much harder than I thought. Um, and it was considerably later that I, I, I got my hands on a good banjo and went, oh, okay, what I need to do is fix this banjo, <laughs> which I did. I fixed it in the, the, the problem with it was that the action on it was way too high. And my solution to that was to take a nail, a big thick nail, a spike really, and force it between the neck and and the the um, the pot where and and that forced the neck back and lowered the action. Of course, it also made the neck kind of wobbly, so you could go wow wow and had a built-in wah wah. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I still I didn't really learn to play until I was 18. When I was 18, I went away to art school in New York, where I didn't know anybody. 
And I brought my banjo, which I virtually couldn't play until then. And I spent a lot of time uh, on my own in my uh, little one room uh, place that I, I lived in with a shared bathroom and um, uh, learned to play the banjo. And my technique of learning was I wrote songs. Since I, I, I didn't have any repertoire and I didn't have any source of repertoire and I um, wrote songs with the idea that for each song I wrote I would add another chord that I didn't know. That's how I learned to play. Right. Well, I mean, the way, the thing they always say to encourage people who are learning guitar is that so much music is just based around the three chords. So it's what you're saying. You can sort of take the same approach to banjo or because... You know, it's an instrument where people often play one note at a time. It does end up being more complicated to just dive into it. Um, yeah, but, you know, I didn't know anything at the time. So I, I at first I treated it as a, 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 a quarterly and I strummed up and down. And um, it took me a while till I... No, I didn't strum up and down. What I did was, uh, the first thing that I learned is I... I looked through the Pete Seeger book and I found something that looked like I could do, which was you picked up with your index finger and then down with your thumb and then up with your index finger and down with your thumb. And that was easy. So I just played everything that way. <laughs> um, and But I, did, I, I didn't play, try to play melody or anything. I just made chord shapes at first. And, and I um, wrote these not very good songs but each one ha added a chord that I didn't know previously. Right. Well, I, I suppose most of the time I saw you performing, I think think of you as a true folk singer in the sense that you're you're not singing your own songs. You're singing songs either by, you know, people from the distant past or songs where we don't know the writer. Uh, but starting out, you would have been doing a lot more of your own writing then. Oh, I, 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 I've written a lot of songs over the years, but I... Um... Actually, lately I've been writing more. Um, I I I I uh, been cranking out songs like it's nobody's business. Um, uh, part of that, it, it it's going back to the same thing of when I was learning to play, in that uh, a little less than three years ago, I guess I I had a series of strokes that um, caused me to lose um, the ability to use my right hand and arm. And I've been regaining my facility at playing. And um, I found it, found it frustrating to try and play things that I couldn't play anymore because of the loss of use of my hands. So I started writing new things that I could play. I, I started, you know, when I could, I, I started writing stuff based on what I can do so that I don't have some previous way that I played it that I'm frustrated that I can't do anymore because it's new. <laughs> but doing that, both that and learning new songs, I, I, not by me, but I, I'm coming up with a, new arrangement, fresh, that I can, am capable of doing without the frustration of uh, having v various aspects of what I could do before not fully recovered. So I've, I've been talking to various people about stage names. Uh, you don't have one, but at one point in your life, you were Umze Simba. Can you tell us about yes. that? Yes. Okay. Well, when I, I in my you know, uh, side career as a lawyer. <laughs> I, I, I worked at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which is located in um, Arusha, Tanzania. And when I went there, I brought some harmonicas with me because I, I knew I couldn't stand to go without any instruments. I did not bring my banjo at first. And a, a situation arose where... Um, the, the lawyers were having a party and there was a band there and the person who was organizing the party said people who play instruments should bring their instruments 
And I was the only one who showed up with instruments. I brought my harmonicas. So I sat in with the band. And the band, they had never seen a harmonica before. And they were enormously impressed with the sound of this instrument. And, and they invited me to play with them anytime I want. So I started sitting in with them. And then pretty soon I found myself being invited to sit in with all the local bands, which I did. Um, so I was starting to be seen as a, as, as a musician there. And at the same time, I had a, um, a taxi driver that uh, took me to work every day. I had an arrangement with him to come to pick me up at, at my house and, and bring me to work. And he was teaching me Swahili in the car. He taught me how to do how to how to give really good directions on where I want to go in a taxi cab. Um, that's as far as I got, but I could get into a taxi cab and I would give really good directions, and the driver would think that I actually spoke Swahili, and he'd start talking to me. And the truth was, all I knew how to do was give directions. Mm-hmm. And um, one day, I um, uh, remarked on uh, the music that was playing to my taxi driver said I really liked it and it was a cassette and he took the cassette out and he gave it to me. So I said to him, I said, do you have children? And he said, yes. I said, well, okay, I, I made a children's album um, and when the next time I go back to Canada, it's on cassette, I'll, I'll bring you a cassette of that. So my, the title of my children's album, which I made in 1985, was That Lion and the cover has a picture of me as a lion, but it's with my face, playing the banjo. So I gave him, I, I brought back a cassette and I gave it to him and I went into work. And when I came out, all the taxi drivers all of a sudden were calling me, Mr. Lion, Mr. Lion, because my taxi driver had apparently played the cassette for all the, the drivers and they all found it very amusing. And um, I suddenly became Mr. Lion. I couldn't step out of that building without, there was like, a ta- the taxi stand was right outside and all, I, going through a gauntlet of people saying, Mr. Lion, Mr. Lion. So, and then people started doing that when I was performing, going, Mr. Lion. And at a certain point they said, you know what, we're, we're in Tanzania, you can't call me Mr. Lion, you have to do it in Swahili. I said, you have to call me Mze Simba, which means old man lion. So they did, and that became my stage name there for the uh, seven years that I was there. I, su- I suppose one of the luxuries of the folk tradition and Pete Seeger in particular is it blurs the line between children's music and non-children's music. Did, did you have a particular approach to writing children's songs versus regular songs? I, I don't know. Um... That's a hard question to, I mean, I, I know what, a, you know, I guess I, I had children in mind when I wrote children's songs. So, um, I mean, I, I, the, 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 well, at, at a certain point in time, the, there was no distinction made between children and, and adults. I wrote stuff that I thought was amusing and entertaining for children. <laughs> right, so can you, I guess you could uh, talk a bit about the material that was on that record. The material that was on that record? Well, it started with uh, the song The Fox, which I learned from a Pete Seeger record when I was a little kid. Um, except on on that record, he had the fox on one side, and on, on the other side, there was a story that he told called The Cumberland Mountain Bear Chase uh, with sound effects. And I kind of put the two ideas together, and I wove in and out of my version of The Fox um, uh, a, a whole story about the fox, a fox being chased by dogs in the woods uh, with sound effects. Um, uh, I don't know, I have a song on there about the, the um, stone lion outside the library coming to life and going inside the library and everybody being afraid he's going to eat them, but instead he goes and reads all the books in the library. Um, had a song about... Uh, had a, uh, a young alligator who didn't want to go to school, but his mother made him take the school bus anyway. And he's so, uh, in, in, he um, started to eat the school bus and, and got carried away and ate the whole school bus. And, and so then they didn't have to go to school because there was no school bus left. Yeah, so I, I guess some rec- recording you've done that's definitely not for children, you're also very interested in murder ballads. 
Yeah, murder ballots and uh, um, the stuff I'm doing recently are, are 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 tend to be serious dark songs. I've been writing a lot of dark songs, um, but you know these are dark times. I'm curious if you have any sense of you know where that tradition of song comes from. Like I, I don't know it very deeply, but I know murder ballot. Yeah, murder, uh, you know that comes from an era. Uh, that predates mass media that comes from um, people wrote songs about the news but what was in the news but what was happening um, a lot a great many murder ballads are based on actual events they become distorted over years and and time and but there's there's a whole genre of, of um, uh, songs about murder. I guess what's what haunts me, and I think I've heard it in some of the songs you sing, is that that idea from like Johnny Cash's Folsom Prison Blues. I I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. Like he's trying to sell you on you know a normal man snapping and suddenly being like, yeah, I just felt like murdering someone. I... Uh, very often the 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 motive for the crime in 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 murder battles is inexplicable. A lot of times it has to do with, with um, an unwanted pregnancy. Uh -huh. So uh, we, we get rid of the problem by murdering the, uh, the pregnant woman. Right. <laughs> well, uh, maybe on a lighter note, uh, one of the yes. that I, I think uh, people tend to hear from you if they go to the yellow door long enough is your defense of Bob Dylan as a singer. <laughs> uh, he's actually has a tremendous tremendous range of uh, uh, an ability in his singing if you listen to his records one after another he sounds different on each one um i don't know and he he um i think he 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 always was you know bothered by the fact that he was not considered a good singer because he he, he is and and he's um it's like i i've read quotes from him saying you know if Willie Nelson does this, they they say it's 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 okay. But if I do it, no, it's not good. And he he listed various people that do various things that that he do, does. And uh, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but in the the last decade, he issued five records of standards. Right. And I'm I'm although he part of it, but they were two single records and then one uh, three record set. Um, I'm sure he did that as if to say, look, I can do these songs too, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do remember hearing some of them. Yeah, they they sounded quite conventionally good. The, the funny thing for me actually is I think the first Bob Dylan album I ever heard was Love and Theft, which is, you know, a really gravelly singing. So when I then went back and heard like a Rolling Stone, I thought, oh, well, his, his voice sounds very smooth by comparison. To that so i i don't think i ever understood the full degree to which people don't like his young voice either oh, well when i actually the first time i heard bob dylan my reaction was i really like these songs but i don't like the sound of his voice and i but the funny thing is i know that to me the reason that i didn't like the sound of his voice is it really reminded me of my voice and i thought i was a really lousy singer this is before i ever took up I was playing the banjo, and um, and when I'd hear my voice on tape, I hated it. Um, and uh, you know, Bob Dylan gave everybody permission to sing with their own natural voice instead of a contrived singer's voice. Uh, you talked a bit about uh, your your other job. Did you feel like, you know, being a lawyer and you, and you did criminal defense, that that's such a professional world that you had to completely separate yourself from your artist self in becoming that? Or I don't know, were you able to find some sort of equilibrium between the two? This is a hard question. I will say when I started as a lawyer, I found myself um, no longer, hardly ever playing and singing. And... Um, I got rescued by the fact that when I went to Arusha, I took up playing and singing, and and I did bring my banjo after after the very first time I I brought my ban I brought a banjo and I left it there, and uh, and I started performing with these bands, and I remember thinking to myself, 
why did I give up performing when I became a lawyer? I really love this. <laughs> so I went back to, you know, continuing to uh, to perform. Of course, they're, they're completely different things. Uh, you know, my my art and, and law are separate aspects of, of, of my life. But, I, you know, I've, I only became a lawyer late in life. I became a lawyer in my uh, late 40s. So I spent a lifetime as an artist who, like so many people, um, was didn't really make a living from their art, both a, a graphic artist and, and, and a musician for me, in my case. Um, so I worked all kinds of jobs all through my life that were, you know, had, sometimes they were numbing and, and, and um, uh, distracted from my, uh, my music, but uh, mostly they were, you know, two completely different aspects. I, I've never, I don't think I've ever written um, any, any music about any of these jobs or law or anything, but. And I just, I like to throw it at everyone and just sort of see whether they, you know, feel okay. like on their job. I'll tell you, I have always considered that my primary work, my life's work, is the arts. Every job I ever have have had, including law, was to to make a living. But that that doesn't mean my my my. I feel that that my mission in life, my my uh, my my life's work, is creating art. Um, uh, you know, whether I was working in a parking lot um, uh, or uh, working in a bookstore or uh, working as a broadcaster or working as a, a CGEP teacher, um, working as a daycare teacher. I did all kinds of different things. They were always my day job to earn a living. They were not my work, my real work has always been uh, uh, the arts. And I mean, I set out to be an artist and went to art school with the intention of only doing art. And while I was at art school, I learned to play the banjo, so it became only doing art and music. But that's such a small slice of people that do art are able to um, actually make a living at it that uh, you know that that was an unrealistic expectation and I realized I had to I've, I've done all kinds of things I, I only listed things that were coming at to the top of my head I you know I I've generally you know worked at something for a couple of years and then went on to do something else law was the longest I ever did anything because I spent almost 20 years as a lawyer um, and at at the beginning of my career, I hated it because I, I just did the, the dinkiest, stupidest, most uninteresting cases. Um, but and, and I did appeals, legal aid appeals for other lawyers who um, uh, didn't want to do their, their appeals. And so they would give them to me. Um, and uh, but I won them. I was really good at it, really good at it. I won the, the first 13 appeals in a row. The first time I lost an appeal was when I did a murder case. <laughs> then, And I never won a murder appeal. <laughs> um, but I became a really good writer, a, a, a legal writer. Um, and um, when I went to Arusha, my job was doing legal writing. I was not. I was in the courtroom, but I was. Uh, I I was not a lawyer who questioned people and stuff. I was the guy who wrote the legal arguments. And at first, I thought, oh, this is not what I want to do. It's so boring. But then here I was at essentially the highest court in the world, and I realized the judges are actually paying attention to what I'm saying. They're responding to my pleadings that I've written, my motions. And um, international criminal law at that time was a really new field, and the law was not at all clear. And so what I ultimately ended up doing is 
making a contribution to shaping international criminal law. We were setting precedents. And uh, I became the, 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 um, the, the main writer of, of legal arguments for um, uh, the whole legal team. It was a large legal team. And it's, anyway, I don't know why I'm going on and on about this. Yeah, no, well, I, mean, I, I think that's you know, a, a good answer for our, our audience. Uh, you know, and one of the things I've been told as well is just how much of certain legal fields comes down to writing and then, you know, writing, you know, channels the creative potential. I suppose what I was thinking is more of a, if, if you're doing work where you feel like, you know, what you're, I, I suppose if one thinks back to a 60s context that some of those lawyers who are defending the Chicago 7, you know, they were mm -hmm. part of the counterculture scene and then those counterculture people were directly tied to the musicians it, and it would have felt like two degrees of separation. Uh, and, you know, it, it sounds like, yeah, you were channeling, you know, that part of your 60s self with, you know, maybe another part of it doing that work. But uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking on a very abstract level here, but uh, <laughs> Mark, this is I, I did I did write, write a song in Arusha about... Um, that came directly out of out of the stuff we were doing in 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 uh, the trial. Um, I, I remember now that um, uh, I sang to our client in jail. <laughs> and I was enormously impressed. <laughs> um, I wrote a couple of songs there that now now that I think of it that came out of. Of that situation, I wrote I wrote a blues from the perspective of General Dallaire and the uh, um, the horror he saw in 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 the, the Rwandan genocide, mm -hmm. and I wrote that that other song, which was essentially condemning Paul Kagame for um, being a war criminal himself. Um, so this is a guy he's been president for 30 years nominally been, yeah he resistance but has all his own problems yeah exactly all right well uh to close off the show we were gonna play a, a recording you did of i believe uh, is it a, it's a slow trains are coming uh like no it's called it's called um oh, long train of rolling there we go long train of rolling yeah is there anything it's, to tell uh, about this song <laughs> okay first of all i'm i'm gonna in in yeah, and talking about this song, I, I get to talk a little bit about the way I write. So um, I write almost always without knowing what I'm writing about. I don't start out with an idea. I start out with a rhyming couplet that comes to my mind. And I concentrate on um, meter and rhyme and I build the song without knowing where it's going. And then very often I reorganize it and change the order of things. And I know that particular song, I wrote it using a rhyming dictionary. And the rhymes that the rhyming dictionary suggested to me, there would be like a whole lot of rhymes in there. And just reading the rhyme, I, like I knew that I wanted to rhyme something with the last word in, in, in a line. And so I'd look up that word and then find a whole bunch of rhymes. And that fed my creativity for finding a thread. And then I went back and changed the things that no longer fit where the song um, had gone. Um, so that's that. The song is about... Um, the, the the title you said you, you thought of Bob Dylan's slow train um, coming uh, it uh, as I was writing this song I felt like I was writing a real a kind of a Dylan-esque song in that it's it's a bit vague about what it's about but I also felt like it it, it has certain religious references and I'm an atheist and um, I, I did it did occur to me, it's like, I'm writing an answer to Bob Dylan's slow train coming. Right. <laughs> now, it wasn't a direct answer, and it wasn't meant to be, but that thought did cross my mind.
soul's in to end. Clickety clack down the track, that train's never coming back. And through darkness and wild badlands it will win. In blistering heat, through dust storms it will roll. Where the darkness will feel just like Sheol Rubbing shoulders all around With dead spirits underground Where everyone's just trying to save their soul And through valleys it will go Across deserts, through deep forests Over snow Passengers from every nation Each one seeking their own salvation Crowd that train Headed where they do not know Yes, its final destination's never known its location on the map is never shown. No one knows where they are going, but they can hear that cold wind blowing round that crowded train where everyone's alone. Anyway, it's a very short song. I, I usually write much longer songs, and uh, I, I I like that song. I like that song enough that I I'm making it the title song of um, my next album, which I'm putting together now. Which um, I actually have it, the fact that you invited me to come and do this program, and then I I um, uh, sent you that song made me think. You know, I think I have enough stuff already recorded that I have another album here, and I looked through all my stuff, and I found oh I was only missing like one song, so I recorded something else. Uh, I I had a, a spot where I wanted to have a lively song, and I so I recorded something in addition but other than that i have put together an album since the time that you um invited me to come on this show and that song that i sent you has become the title song of the album and i uh, i started um i i just have to remaster the music but i've already uh, done a, uh, a cover and um uh, it, it won't take long to remaster the music. It's just a question of making sure all the levels are the same between all the songs. And I've started sending it in. I I, I put my stuff both on on uh, I use uh, Bandcamp, but I also I I put my stuff through um, CD Baby where it gets sent to all the uh, you know iTunes, Spotify, and and all those places. So. I've 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 started the process of of entering the data for for its distribution. Excellent. Well, uh, you heard it here first, folks. Uh, Mark Nuremberg, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. So that was my interview with Mark Nuremberg, and you just heard his song, "A Long Train's a Rolling." So I hope you got a sense of you know how cool it would be to attend an open mic hosted by this guy. So if you're in Montreal, absolutely give the Yellow Door a try. Uh, You've seen some Yellow Door alumni. If you've seen other interviews on the show, Karen Chung, Laren Tebby, uh, Louis Piano Bunker. Uh, we all have fond memories of the place, of drawing the names out of the hat, uh, clapping when the names are read. Uh, and it's just so great that Mark has been a part of that tradition all these years. And you know, we had a great chat after this interview, including he told me, gave me some interviewing tips from time when he was working at the CBC. He's, he's really done a lot with his life and it all sounds fascinating. And as someone who likes to do a lot with my life, I, I'm glad to take the pointers. So uh, I'm glad Mark joined us on the show today and you know, keep supporting uh, singer songwriters of all kinds of backgrounds by checking out these interviews. I'm Zach Morgenstern. This is Ludwig von B. See you next time. <music>